now we can do some of the things we just dreamed about before. What we want to do is to provide relevant, compelling solutions that customers can only get from Apple. Today we're going to talk about system software at Apple. It turns out that 1997 is going to be a very big year for our operating system and system software in general. In fact, we think it's going to be the biggest year for system software in the history of Apple Computer. The reason why that's true is we have a lot of releases coming up for Mac OS, a lot of new technologies, a lot of great new products. But of course, we also just announced our acquisition of Next Software, and it's going to be building a complete new generation operating system as well. So taken together, it's going to be a very big year. Some of the highlights are Mac OS 7.6 that's just started shipping, the Mac runtime for Java that also just started shipping, we also just introduced a new version of QuickTime VR for our virtual reality on the desktop. And then, of course, we'll give you more details about the new system that we codename Rhapsody, which is a combination of Mac OS and Next Software. We start out the year by shipping Mac OS 7.6, our newest version of the Apple operating system. 7.6 really focused on the installation process at the very beginning. So you'll notice the engineers have built an entire new installer that steps the user through the various processes to get a nice, reliable version installed on this disk. It even checks the hard disk to make sure it's got the latest driver as part of the installation process. That used to be optional. Also, 7.6 has a new extensions manager. So when you're configuring your system, turning extensions on and off, you can read what they do. You can also even save a setting and share that with other people in your department. 7.6 is also nice in terms of the internet integration. In fact, it gives a wide variety of internet software directly in the box. So users can pick between something like America Online, or Apple's CyberDog Internet Suite, or Netscape Navigator, all depending on the type of user and what you need to do with the internet. Mac OS 7.6 also delivers a lot of performance improvements. So for example, you'll find big files can open and save faster. You'll find that big applications can open and close faster. You'll also find that printing across the network can be faster as well. In some situations, these operations can be up to 40% faster. This is because some of the software has been rewritten as native PowerPC code. Also, we've just implemented some of the newer versions of software, which are, are faster algorithms. Also, the engineers have taken a look at some of the low-level parts of the operating system, speeded them up. One of the other nice things about Mac OS 7.6 is you get a lot of technologies on a single CD-ROM. So if one pass installation, you can get a lot of the different technologies that you might be using in-house on a single machine. You don't need to go to the website, download software, you don't need to do multiple install installers, you just do one pass. Apple has also recently introduced the Macintosh runtime for Java. What this does is actually breaks Java outside of web browsers. Today, most people, when they're using Java, they do it within a browser. But with the new runtime, what you're able to do is run an application or a Java applet outside a browser, and in fact, even not connected to a network if that's what you need. So if you're writing Java software in-house, you can actually run it directly on this runtime. The runtime that Apple has introduced is based on the source code from Sun Microsystems. It is part of the 100% pure Java initiative of Sun, and Apple is a member of that initiative. Also, the Macintosh runtime for Java incorporates a new technology from a startup called Marimba, which allows people to run Java software outside of web browsers and subscribe to channels across the network. Again, this is an innovative use of Java, and Macintosh is bringing it to you directly as part of the operating system. This summer, Apple will be introducing a new version of the Mac OS that we call Tempo. Tempo delivers two main areas. One is a new user experience, and secondly, a lot of new internet integration, a lot of new features for the internet. When you install Tempo, you're going to notice right away the new user interface. It has a new look and feel, really overhauling the look and feel that we've had for several years. But there's more to it than just the surface. This is actually the new finder that we've been working on as part of the Copeland project. So it's PowerPC native. It's multi-threaded, so multitasking is smoother, and you can do things like launch an application while you're copying many files or open up at one folder while in the background a folder that's got lots of icons off say a server is being brought up and that might be very slow. So this multi-threading capability is going to make you more productive. Additionally, the new finder really focuses on how people use the Macintosh and with new navigation services like spring-loaded folders, pop-up windows, 
it's going to be a very useful release. And I think it's going to make Tempo one of the most notable, noticeable releases for the end user that we've had in many years. Tempo also continues our efforts to integrate the internet more directly into the operating system. Like today's system, you'll get a variety of internet tools, you'll have your own choices of different browsers to use with Tempo. But Tempo goes further by bringing things like the Macintosh Runtime for Java as part of the installation. It also introduces a new technology called personal web sharing. This allows any Macintosh to share web pages just like it shares files today. So within your company or within a work group, you can set up a mini web server and anybody can access it through any browser off any computer. Tempo will also bring in an easier setup for the internet, basically taking some of the technologies that we find very successful with the Apple Internet Connection Kit and put them as part of the operating system itself. We'd like to explain some details that go into Rhapsody, which is the new operating system combining the Macintosh OS with the software from Next Software. With Rhapsody, we have a couple of key objectives. One of the most important is to provide a very smooth transition. We want to make sure that the software you run today, the files you create today, the databases you have today, will still run under Rhapsody. We also want to make sure that the hardware you buy today, the Macintosh systems you get today, will be able to run the Rhapsody operating system. And we have some experience with this. We did the PowerPC transition a couple of years ago and went very smoothly. We're actually applying a lot of lessons from that transition to this project. When we get there, we expect to have a very advanced operating system because of the capabilities that we bring from the next software. At the same time, we will also have the traditional advantages of the Macintosh in multimedia, internet integration, things like that. It's important to realize that Rhapsody itself is a very modern operating system. It will deliver some of the low-level system services that people have been wanting in Macintosh for a number of years now, like protected memory, preemptive multitasking, symmetrical multiprocessing. Today, the Macintosh has multitasking and it has multi multiple processing, but it's not at the same level of capabilities or the same level of reliability. For Frapsty, it definitely will be. In fact, I'd sometimes like to say Frapsty is fully buzzword compliant, but that's not good enough alone. What's very exciting about Rhapsody is it goes beyond some of these services that a lot of operating systems can offer and offers a complete new breakthrough programming environment that is really unique in the industry. The productivity that a developer has on the next software is far beyond what they have on Macintosh or Windows today. The goal here is to literally eliminate 80% of the code that every developer has to write for their app because it's in common with every other app and let them focus on just the 20% of their code that's unique and value add to their app. I'm gonna build a very trivial little application just to show you how we do this. So we're gonna get a window here and we have pallets of objects up here. We have menus, uh, we have some little UI widgets and you can add your own widgets and we'll just take a text field right here and we'll uh, bring up the font panel here and we'll go ahead and uh, make that a large font so we can all read it and uh, we'll grab a slider right here and we will go ahead and um, set that slider to uh, just have a value from uh, 0 to 100 and we will then make a connection between that slider and the text field by dragging a line and a panel will pop up and it'll go interrogate that text object and show me all the messages that text object can understand. And we'll pick one that says, uh, you know, take the floating point value. And now, we don't have to compile anything because we're not generating any code. We'll just say, run. And these objects will run themselves. And now when we drag the slider, we'll get values from 0 to 100. And what's happening is, is these objects are just communicating at runtime. No code's been generated, there's no code to maintain. What we found a long time ago was the line of code that a developer can write the fastest, the line of code that a developer can maintain the cheapest, and the line of code that never breaks for the user is the line of code the developer never had to write. <laughs> so, we'll go do a little more here and we'll say, um, great, let's uh, move this up here, let's move this here, let's go grab a, uh, let's go grab a text field here. And we will, um, 
we will say we want to enable graphics in this text field here. And uh, we can then go back to our application and just run it. And again, you see this still works. And here's some text, and we can just type in this thing. And now we want to make the fonts a little bigger. Ah, forgot to put the font commands in. So great, we just go back here, grab the menu to that app, and we just say, let's grab a font menu and drop it in. And we'll go run our application again. And now we can type in some text. And we can go back and we can bring a font menu up, just like in every other app in the system. Select different fonts, select different sizes. We can even go grab some pictures and drag and drop them in, et cetera, et cetera. And again, this is how apps are built. They're built incrementally. They're built by connecting objects together. And they're built by removing code for the developers. Now let's take a look at some of the details about how RAPSD actually works. It's built on the PowerPC processor and runs on the Macintosh systems that we're shipping today, also runs on the Macintosh compatible systems that are sold by our licensees today. The next layer up is the core operating system itself. That's based on the mock microkernel. And this handles your networking, your file I.O. This, is, this layer is completely PowerPC native, so this is where you get the performance improvements. This is also what gives us some of the low-level system services like preemptive multitasking and protected memory. Built on top of the core OS are two major services. First is the Mac OS compatibility box. Shown on the diagram here is the blue box. This is what gives us very good backwards compatibility for existing Macintosh software. This is not an emulator of Mac OS, but in fact this is the same source code that we ship as Mac OS but re-hosted on top of the modern microkernel. Also on top of the core OS is the OpenStep programming model, shown in our diagram as a yellow box called the OpenStep APIs. This is the area that we bring forward the next software that allows for the very efficient developer environment that we talked about earlier. Applications written here are not held back by any old architectural considerations. These new applications can take advantage of memory protection and preemption. Also, Apple will be bringing forward certain core technologies like QuickTime and also hosting them on the yellow box. Lastly, we should point out the programmer also has access to the Java APIs. So people can write software in Java and also take advantage of the OpenStep system stability that we get through Rhapsody. Rhapsody also delivers a new advanced look and feel which combines the best of Mac OS and Next software. But we're going to make it very familiar to a Macintosh user. So if you know how to use a Macintosh today, you're going to be able to sit down with a system running Rhapsody and be productive right away. Rhapsody will deliver very good compatibility with the software you're using today. The reason why that works is that Rhapsody actually rehosts today's Mac OS on top of the modern microkernel. We bring it over as it is today, including even the low-level architecture of the Mac OS. What this means is you can keep using the software you're using today. You can use your applications and utilities. You can also use the files that you're creating today, whether they're databases or movies or documents or spreadsheets. Even things like fonts and extensions and control panels, they'll continue to work under Rhapsody. Now the major exception for compatibility under Rhapsody is software that touches the hardware directly. Because the architecture of Rhapsody, that will change. So hardware drivers, drivers that talk to scanners and hard drives and monitors, they'll change. This is very normal for a system software change of this magnitude. But the nice thing is, most applications don't do that. In fact, most utilities don't do that. So most of the software that you run today is going to run unmodified on Rhapsody. Let's look at the roadmap for delivering system software from Apple. The first thing you'll notice is there are actually two product lines going forward. One is the traditional Mac OS that will continue to improve and release new versions of as time passes. Secondly, of course, is Rhapsody, the new operating system. What's nice about this two-track strategy is it allows you to decide when you want to move to the new operating system based on your business, your software, and your needs. We are planning on three upcoming releases for Rhapsody. The first is a release that's targeted for developers only. We call this the developer release. We expect this in the third calendar quarter of this year. This will essentially be OpenStep and Next Software delivered on the PowerPC. Then about a year from now, we expect to deliver what we call the premier release of Rhapsody. 
This is basically an early adopter release and really focuses on OpenStep and the next technologies. We expect to have some Macintosh compatibility in that release, but we're not expecting that to be something many people can use. The key function of that release is if you have new applications built on OpenStep, you can run them with the Premiere release. Then the third release is the unified release, scheduled for mid-1998. That is the release that we've been describing here, with full Macintosh compatibility and the capabilities from Next Software integrated into a single operating system. From there, Apple will continue to upgrade Rhapsody, just as we continue to upgrade Mac OS moving forward. In summary, Apple is developing both Mac OS and Rhapsody. Mac OS will continue for years to come, with upgrades already planned and Rhapsody will combine macOS with Next Software to create a breakthrough operating system. In doing so, we're also going to be preserving your software and hardware investments, so the work you're doing today will last for years to come.